Hello Internet, this is Oscar Vies again. For this video, we'll be going over Girard's method for minimizing functions, also known as successive parabolic interpolation, not to be confused with Girard's root finding method, which is also called Girard's method. We'll go over the history, and then I'll try to visualize how this method works, as well as going over an example, and then cool fractals. For scaffolding, you should know something about minimization, such as ternary search, as well as interpolation using Lagrange polynomials. Check out my videos if you haven't already. And for examples of using interpolation to find roots, check out my videos on inverse quadratic interpolation and Muller's method. Let us again turn back to Algorithms for Minimization Without Derivatives by Richard Brent. In it, he writes, Girat suggests a method to find a minimum using successive parabolic interpolation. With arbitrary starting points, Girat's method may diverge or converge to a maximum or inflection point. This is the paper that Brent was referring to, Girat's an iterative method for locating turning points. It says, We fit the quadratic to three points and then predict x sub i plus 1 by imposing the condition that y prime at i plus 1 equals 0. This leads to the system, this system. In order to obtain the numerically most accurate representation of the iterative formula, we may solve for phi sub i plus 1, the result being this equation. This is known as Girard's method. Let's try to apply Girard's method to find the minimum of the function x cubed over 3 minus x squared over 2 minus x minus 1. Let's start at the points 1, 2, and 3. Using our three starting points, we evaluate them at our function, then plug everything into our second order Lagrange polynomial to give us this function. Plotting the L2 goes to the same three points. Keep in mind that the order of the points doesn't really matter. For example, x2, x1, and x0. Or having x2 in the middle. Our next step is to find where the derivative of L2 is 0. This will give us our next value for x. To find that point, we need our L2 function so that we can compute its derivative. Then evaluate that function equal to 0, giving x3 equal to 14 over 9. Then, using these three points, I have already plotted our next L2. We then find the derivative of that function and compute where that is equal to 0, giving us our next value for x4 plotted right there. You would then repeat the process. Girat actually figured out a more efficient way to do this without computing L2 and its derivative every time. Using this system of equations, we can make sure that our parabola goes through our same three test points and that the derivative at our next point will be zero. Recall that our x's and y's are actually known. This gives us four equations and four unknowns. Plugging that into a solver, we get this equation for our next value for x. More commonly, we would write it like this. We'll stop iterating once our change in x is becomes less than some epsilon in absolute value. Note, as Brent mentioned, this might find a maximum or inflection point, and it also can diverge or divide by zero. Let's apply Girard's method to the function x cubed over 3 minus x squared over 2 minus x minus 1 with an ending epsilon 10 to the minus 6, starting with points 2, 1, and 1.5. You notice that this converges very quickly. In fact, it's much faster than any of the methods that we've talked about so far. In fact, Drop proves that this method is superlinear with an order of 1.325. Fans of the channel know that I like to use numerical methods to create fractals. If you haven't already, check out my video on Newton fractals. Here is the complex plane. For example, the point at 1 half on the real number line plus i. We then color this point depending on how many iterations it takes to converge or diverge to create a fractal. In this case, here is the Newton fractal for the arctangent function. What about Dirac's method? For example, starting at the point 1, we still need two more points. Let's add points directly to the left and right of our starting point. And while not entirely necessary, I like to leave our last point in the middle. This works on the real number line, 
But what about the imaginary one? In this case, it's actually better if we move our points directly above and below. So what if our starting point was not on any of these lines? For example, over here, it's better if we draw the radius to that middle point and then compute the angle. Afterwards, align our points along that radius. This approach actually works for any angle. Like this one, or these. Let's try to find the extrema of the function z to the fourth over four minus z using Girard's method. Giving us our Girard fractal for this function. Let's actually color it not on whether it converged or diverged, but rather which extrema it converged to. Which looks like this. It almost seems to have a sort of Mandelbrot effect in the middle. Let's alter it by adding the variable a in front, such as the value of one half plus i over two. Giving a sort of pinwheel effect. Let's zoom in. Here, you can clearly see the sorts of spirals within spirals. Here is the function for negative cosine, which converges quickly at around zero and pi, but has a very interesting effect around the point pi over two. If this had a director, I'd say it was the Wachowskis. Here's the last function that we'll go over, which is z to the ninth over nine plus three z to the fifth minus 16 z, giving this sort of tendril effect. Let's color it based on the extrema, giving us this fractal. Notice that a lot of this is actually missing. Let's color that back in, in gray. These points are where Girard either diverged, converged to an inflection point, or took such a small step that the fractal thought it converged. Here is that same fractal, now with the variable a in front of one half plus i over two. Let's zoom in on the center. I'm getting Denis Villeneuve vibes from this, but let me know which director you think would have made this fractal. Going back to Girard's paper, there is some discussion of using higher order Lagrange polynomials but then this might lead to you having multiple roots for L prime, as well as complex extrema for those roots. The paper also shows the order is 1.325, and Girard also discusses accelerating convergence and how you can't use Aitken's delta squared, providing instead two other ways, which I won't get into in this video. Girard closes by saying, the iterative technique discussed in this paper has been tested on a good number of practical problems and has been found to work extremely well it should prove valuable in any problem where f prime is difficult to obtain. Some key points are that Girard's method needs three starting points and that it finds extrema, any extrema, this includes maximum and inflection. It's also not guaranteed to converge, but when it does, it will do so with a super linear order. It also works with complex numbers. Definitely check out Brett's minimization method, which builds heavily on Girard and the code that are used, as well as the images that are created, will be hosted on GitHub. As always, thank you for watching. This video was especially difficult to make and went through many revisions before I thought that things made sense. Definitely let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And again, thank you for watching.